uh, one of the sponsors of our event today is Gowling that I'm a counsel of, and I should tell you that every new client who comes in, whether they're small, big, international, or national, doesn't matter, we have a very lengthy know your client questionnaire, and if they're not finished, you can't even open a file for them. And I think that's becoming a lot more common now, among um, law firms at least. I know banks have uh, obviously moved into that quite heavily, but uh, Diane makes a very valid point. Her, uh, her uh, presentation obviously raises some very serious issues that uh, Canada needs to address. Now, this panel is dealing with the topic historical and contemporary money laundering techniques. Now, for those of you who thought this was a primer on how to launder money, you should go and get your money back on the way out because that's not what we're talking about. Um, we're fortunate to have with us today three very knowledgeable speakers who have first-hand experience and insights in dealing with the whole issue of money laundering at various levels. Our first speaker will be Chief Superintendent John Sullivan of the Ontario Provincial Police. Over the years, Superintendent Sullivan has been involved in money laundering investigations as an undercover operator and as an investigator. So he brings first-hand knowledge for, across province on this. Our second speaker, Point it from the point of view of financial institutions, and he is Peter Warwick, who is the head of investigations in the anti-money laundering intelligence unit at the Royal Bank of Canada. Our third speaker is Detective Alfen Chan of the Toronto Police Service, where he manages the computer cyber crime unit. So, we've got three great speakers. With, with a great uh, diversity in terms of dealing with this issue. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask each of the speakers to come forward to make a presentation, uh, probably in the range of 10 minutes or so, not a lot of time on, on such a topic, and then we'll go to questions and answers. Thanks, John. Uh, things very, move very quickly in my world. Um, I left RBC, actually, I was announced as RBC in 2013. Um, I'm currently uh, Director of uh, AML Advisory and also as it relates to FinTrack at um, Bank of Montreal, um, so no, no, no longer with um, RBC. Uh, Pity Diane's left actually, she made some very interesting comments and thought-provoking comments. Uh, just a quick show of hands, who, who owns Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency? A few? Okay. So do I. Uh, I wouldn't advise to spend it. I would I would advise to um, put it in a secure place, a secure wallet, a hard wallet, which, which is offline or something like that. Uh, I totally agree with um, uh, Diane's comments generally in terms of ICOs, initial coin off offerings. Um, I see that as, uh, as Diane said, it's a fraudster's dream. Uh, I call it a pyramid of tears waiting to fall. Having said that, there are some real genuine ICOs, uh, and it is a genuine way to raise legitimate funds for people that might not otherwise be able to do so and, and who are uh, entre entrepreneurial, innovative, etc. So I, my prediction is that's all going to shake, start shaking out um, next year. I thought what I would do is just to give some foundational context here, uh, and then we can get into uh, panel type questions later after we've all, all presented. So. So, yeah, the views are my own, uh, not my employers. Uh, so this is the first thing I was asked to talk to. I'll talk to it fairly quickly. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, banks and regulated um, entities and financial institutions are required to do two things by law, and that law is the Proceeds of Crime Money Laundering Terrorist Financing Act in uh, Canada. The first thing we're, that we're required to do is identify, and the second thing is report uh, suspicious transactions or attempts that we suspect on reasonable grounds to do so, which is a very low threshold, uh, relate uh, to money laundering and or terrorist financing. Uh, so that's, that sets the tone, that's the law for the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that banks and other people spend every year uh, servicing these requests. 
<clears throat> it's very difficult to see this slide. I understand that, so I'm going to talk you through it. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, how do we detect and, and report suspicious transactions? Uh, and and where, where do we send um, that information? The first thing we need in, in green uh, is some kind of a trigger. Uh, sorry, the, the first blue one, top right blue, is some kind of a trigger event that uh, enables us as a financial institution to identify a suspicious transaction. So there's various ways of doing that. Uh, typically, uh, a bank or something like that will have an internal process, uh, usually called a, a UTR, unusual transaction report, unusual activity report, that anybody and everybody in the, the, in the organization is required to uh, submit to their anti-money laundering department if they see unusual activity that they, they think may, may relate to money laundering and terrorist financing. So that's, that's, uh, that's the first means. Second means is, in any large institution, quite sophisticated uh, and automated transaction monitoring um, technology, uh, which basically monitors you know, the hundreds and if not billions of transactions every day, uh, the amounts, the values, the volumes, the velocities of those transactions in the, in the context of a particular customer or group of customers segment or behavior. So, for instance, um, you know, somebody, an import or export business might have a certain uh, profile, i.e. They, they deal with certain countries, they might use wires as a product, etc. What does that customer's activity look like in comparison to another customer in that uh, segment, etc.? If it stands out in an unusual way, that creates an alert which goes to the anti-money laundering department uh, for further investigation. Other triggers, typically adverse media. So any of the major institutions on a daily ba basis monitor the, the media, the people arrested, charged, convicted, uh, obviously for money laundering and terrorist financing, but also for the underlying predicate offenses that <clears throat> John uh, mentioned, uh, some, some of them for sure, uh, that give rise to the, the illicit proceeds of the crime. So somebody's selling drugs, they get cash, that's, that's, we call that the proceeds of crime. When they basically start to move that cash in a way that disguises the trail, it then becomes suspicious and reportable. So who do we report to? So the, the bottom red um, segment is FinTrack, uh, which is our national financial intelligence unit. They receive uh, all the reports from uh, various financial institutions and others, uh, which are called suspicious transaction reports, STRs. They all go electronically, usually electronically, to FinTrack. FinTrack collates that information. They conduct additional research. FinTrack has access to various government systems, law enforcement, etc., and they really enhance that product uh, and put it into a, a package uh, that is hopefully actionable from an intelligence perspective. FinTrack's paradigm is compliance for intelligence, so banks, for instance, doing all this work in reporting uh, to provide intelligence, and then the, the, the other part of it is the work that FinTrack does, uh, which is disclosure for, for enforcement. So if, it, if the intelligence meets a certain threshold uh, and satisfies certain criteria, FinTrack will disclose that proactively to um, law enforcement, <clears throat> or alternatively, if law enforcement uh, is conducting an investigation, they can submit a report to FinTrack called a VER voluntary information report, basically saying, dear FinTrack, do you have any information on uh, Peter Warren? So that's how the system works. The, the green box at the top is and, uh, and what I call applied, applied intelligence. And what that means is um, occasionally, and sometimes we get a heads up, say, from, from law enforcement. Uh, and basically, that heads up uh, allows us to think, you should look at this. So uh, an example would be a production order. So a production order s served by John's team on a bank would, would or should cause that bank to start an investigation into the, the subject of that production order. 
And again, if that investigation um, identifies what we consider suspicious activity, then we are mandated to feed the FinTrack machine, and then FinTrack um, passes it back to law enforcement. It's a pretty simple process on one slide, but uh, hugely complicated uh, in terms of technology and literally the numbers of people in Canada involved in this, just as investigators. Any of the big banks is well over 100 people just doing these types of investigations. So I want to set some context here. Uh, Bitcoin is the world's first blockchain. So Diane mentioned that there are other applications of blockchain um, other than Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is the world's first blockchain. Secondly, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain has never been hacked as of this moment in time. Certainly, things associated with it have been hacked, like an exchange, uh, no different really from uh, your computer being hacked uh, and you losing the, you know, the, the keys to your bank account. But the actual blockchain upon which Bitcoin is based has never been hacked. Very important to remember. Secondly, we, we're gonna talk, we, talk, we hear a lot about Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is the, you know, the most well-known um, virtual currency, but there are thousands of other virtual currencies, which concern me personally far more than, than Bitcoin, and we'll hear more about that, I'm sure, as, as we go on. Some of, them, some of the other currencies, more well, better known ones, are Ethereum, also known as Ether, um, Litecoin, and Monero, and there are literally thousands of, of other coins. Bitcoin is not Anonymous. Well, we'll talk about that more, I'm sure, today. Bitcoin is a virtual currency. It's also a digital, digital currency. So some people get confused about the term virtual currency. I personally don't like it um, uh, because a virtual currency is also the, can, can also be the kind of currency you play games with in um, Warcraft and things like that. Uh, but certainly within Canada, and I think generally now within FATF and places like that, we refer to Bitcoin and those other currencies as virtual currencies. What that means is they're actually digital currencies, like online, uh, but the, with the addition of crypt crypto cryptography to um, um, basically make, certainly in the case of Bitcoin, the the information about the transactions immutable. So immutable can't be changed, or certainly can't be changed easily. <clears throat> and as I'm sure we know, um, Bitcoin in Canada is neither legal, illegal, or regulated. I, I got here a bit early this morning. The price of Bitcoin uh, currently is 9,000, or a few minutes ago was $9,345. It had dropped a little bit this morning when I got here, so I bought some more. Uh, I'm at this every single day, as I'm sure Amber and people like that are. Uh, it's quite volatile. <clears throat> Very quickly, um, Diana had mentioned that um, the blockchain is a ledger. So uh, that's a good dis description. It's actually a series of ledgers in blocks. So if you think of these as pages in a ledger, or a, a, a sheet in an Excel workbook. Uh, each page, in the case of Bitcoin, uh, contains certain information like a date, a time, a credit or a debit, and the amount. Simple as that. Each block, each page of information, if you want, is uh, encrypted. Uh, the information is secured through the use of cryptography. So what that means is, is all the entries in a particular block are basically hashed um, and they're, they're allocated a hash, a hashtag, which is basically a series of numbers or letters of, of a fixed length. And what that means is if that, any piece of that information is changed, then the hash will change and won't be the same. 
So that's the way that uh, the information, in the case of Bitcoin, is secured and verified and open uh, for everybody to see publicly in the case of Bitcoin. Bitcoin transactions, anybody here can download every single transaction that, that has ever occurred on Bitcoin, if you have enough memory to do it. It's publicly available software uh, that anybody can download and anybody can see. So from that point of view, the transactions are not anon anonymous. Now, who owns those particular entries is a different thing. And much like a, a bank account, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because I think Alan and, and, and we're going to talk to this more today. You know, you need to be able to access your holdings if you want uh, on the blockchain. And it's really no different from your bank client card that gives you access to the information and you punch in a pin and that's your key, your private key to, to unlock that, those transactions and actually spend or send or transfer uh, the value allocated to the blockchain. <clears throat> About two years ago, I think, uh, I published an article um, in uh, ACAM's Anti-Money Laundering Association magazine uh, called When Two Worlds Collide. You can download it, it's free. Um, and what I wanted to do in that article was set out uh, the concept of how we, we, we in the banking industry at the time, understand and kind of put our head around uh, cryptocurrency versus traditional banking and, and things like that. So out of that uh, came two environments, the, the interactive and the contained environment. I think I'll go to the contained one first. What that means, and I appreciate it's hard to see, but what that means, every transaction is contained, for example, in the Bitcoin world. So it's online, it doesn't touch a bank, doesn't touch a, a traditional banking system, it's all online and contained, if that makes sense. And that can include the spending of Bitcoins. So you can buy a car with Bitcoins, you can buy a house with Bitcoins, uh, you can do all sorts of things. It's gone, actually, Bitcoin has gone from being uh, the concept of buying a Starbucks, although you still can in certain places, more to a store of value or, or a way of moving <clears throat> larger sums of money across borders, etc. There was a, an article this morning on Twitter um, uh, predicting that um, the price of Bitcoin in Zimbabwe is about to rocket uh, for obvious reasons, because people would want to secure their money in a place where they can get it out of the country, get it out of a bank, etc. cetera. <clears throat> um, but the contained environment is everything takes place within uh, that online environment. In the interactive environment, this is where cryptocurrency meets, for instance, the traditional banking system. If I can figure out how to work this laser. So I'll try, and, I'll try and talk us through this. Um, so this example here is you have a drug dealer. And you have somebody down here, suspect two, who wants to buy drugs from that dealer. The suspect two, the, the, the purchaser, may, may go on to what we call the dark web, the dark web, uh, the, un the unindexed part of the internet where uh, you know, you have the dark markets where you can basically buy everything and anything, drugs, people, guns, um, contacts the seller. Um, the seller will say, uh, the dark markets typically uh, deal in Bitcoin, but not just Bitcoin, uh, Monero as well, and Ethereum, Ether, two other coins as well. And the dealer will say, okay, send me the price in Bitcoin and send it to my wallet. Wallet. So a wallet is a place you can, there are different kinds of wallets, but uh, in its most simplest form, a wallet is a place where you, st you can store your Bitcoin. Other types of wallet will also allow you to buy and sell Bitcoin. But um, let's keep it simple. A, a wallet that uh, can store Bitcoin and you can transfer Bitcoin in and Bitcoin out 
but you can't sell it or buy it through that wallet, right? So the money goes into a wallet, the drug dealer delivers the drug somehow, maybe by drone with, by Amazon or something. But then the drug dealer will have more than one wallet, for instance. So several wallets, maybe opened on different Bitcoin exchanges, a place where you can open wallets online, and basically moves the funds from one wallet to another. At some point, the drug dealer, so all that happens, all that happens within that digital contained environment. But at some point, the drug dealer wants to cash out, cash the digital currency for fiat currency, dollars. Um, so typically, he would do that, he or she would do that through an exchange. So he would instruct an exchange to convert, sell, transfer uh, X number of bitcoins uh, and send it, maybe by wire, uh, to an account at bank one. So now we're in a, the traditional banking world. So you know, banks see the, the money coming in from exchanges. Right? So if that was TD Bank, for instance, I'm not picking on TD, any bank, but any bank other than BMO, um, you know, they would see an incoming payment from a, a, a cryptocurrency exchange if they knew what to look for, if they knew the names of the exchanges, et cetera. And that's fine, and that you know they they may do an investigation, they may not. Um, my my wallet is linked to my bank debit card. You know these transactions occur in the millions every day, quite legitimately, uh, from exchanges. But then uh, you know the money laundering process example. The drug dealer also holds an account, say at Bank of Montreal. And then the drug dealer instructs TD to make a transfer to the Bank of Montreal account. So now if I'm in Bank of Montreal, I don't know that there's a link to that Bitcoin world in this example. And that's a challenge. So that's just an example of how money could be laundered um, using crypto and traditional fiat currency. I had to, well, I didn't have to, I, I commented on Twitter and everything the other day when some of the media announced Bitcoin ATM scam. Did you see that? I don't know how many people, 40 or 70, I'm not sure, maybe Alpha's going to talk to this later, were basically contacted by the CRA and instructed, you know, that they owe money and to go to the local Bitcoin ATM and um, make that payment. There are different types of Bitcoin ATM. I'm not going to get into it. Maybe an alpha will. Uh, some require uh, identification of some sort. Others don't. Uh, I suspect that the ones involved in this scam didn't require any identification. Just put your cash in, put in your Bitcoin address where to send it that was provided to you by the bad guys, and away it goes. One thing about Bitcoin, once it's gone, that transaction is irreversible. You can't change it for the reason I described, because it's hashed, right? You can't change it, you can't recall it or anything like that. So this wasn't a Bitcoin ATM scam, this was a CRA scam. In, but, but in this case, the bad guys are, are um, using Bitcoin as a, as a means to be paid. The Bitcoin die pack, again, I've published and quoted this term. Um, what I mean by this is, I'm sure we've all heard of ransomware attacks, malware attacks, you know, uh, send us money or send us some Bitcoin or, you know, your, your system's closed down forever, your computer's totally messed up, you can't get access. If you think about it, it's maybe not the best way to get paid in ransom. So if you talk to Jonathan Levine, who runs a company called Chain Analysis, and, we, and his company does most of the work, I think, around the world in terms of analyzing that publicly available information on the Bitcoin blockchain, you know, which transactions went to where, from which wallets, et cetera, um, it's probably not the best way to, to be paid in ransom. 
because as soon as you try to cash out, convert your Bitcoin, the ransom, to fiat through an exchange, everybody's watching you. The way Bitcoin works is what's called nodes, people who've downloaded the full software program around the world are watching. And when something like that happens, everybody's watching for that money to move. So I don't know, I don't have the full statistics, but uh, I'm fairly confident in, in saying that, you know, with the, some of the most recent attacks, only a small percentage of that ransom was actually moved out of the blockchain. The rest is still sitting there, frozen, if you want, in wallets. So that's why I call it the Bitcoin die pack, because it's like walking into a bank and stealing cash, and it goes bang, and it's red. Well, effectively, these Bitcoins now are red, and parked in these wallets with the world watching. As soon as they start to move, um, you know, then you start to get some evidence to try and uh, trace it. There are obviously, obviously challenges with that in terms of jurisdictions um, and things like that. Maybe Alpha will talk to that. But it's probably not the best way to, to be paid ransom. <clears throat> Having said that, a coin like Monero, which basically has a, a, a built-in privacy function, which, mix, which mixes all the transactions up, sorry, which mixes all the transactions up or tumbles them uh, to kind of disguise the trail, uh, might be a better way to go if you want to be paid in, in ransom. In fact, in the, in the malware attacks that did occur, um, uh, the money that was cashed out, some of it was cashed out um, by converting the money, the Bitcoins to Monero coin using a program called Shapeshift. Shapeshift is totally legal doesn't require any identi and identity or anything like that. It works very simply. It basically said, what currency do you want to convert to what currency? Digital currency, right? So you say, I want to convert Bitcoin to Monero, $1,000 worth of Bitcoin to the equivalent of Monero. Select the drop down, press the button. Obviously, you have to supply your wallet addresses where you want the funds to come from and go back to. Done. Doesn't ask you your name, nothing, right, done. So it's, it would be the layering stage of what J John had mentioned. Very quickly, maybe we'll get into this on the panel um, more, uh, and maybe we'll hear some country information later during the day, particularly from some of our US college colleagues who may be more informed from the law enforcement side of things. Uh, but generally, there's, there's a thought that uh, Bitcoin is not a huge problem currently um, with terrorism. Um, the, the quote on the left, uh, recent as two weeks ago, I'll read it for you. Yeah. Uh, cryptocurrency is not currently believed to, to be a widespread, widespread form of terrorist financing, and it goes on. The person making that quote, her name uh, is uh, Brittany from the RCMP, terrorist financing side of things. And that's two weeks ago at the ACAMS uh, money laundering conference held here in Toronto. She, was, she said that. The current uh, UK Home Office um, threat assessment report um, basically says the same thing. Uh, even goes further. Uh, it says, terrorist use of digital currencies is assessed to be unlikely to increase significantly in the next five years. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Five years is a long time, particularly in the cryptocurrency space. You know, Bitcoin's only, I think, how old is it, nine years? Nine years? 2009? Yeah. Um, so a lot can happen very quickly. Absolutely, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, are the payment method of choice in what I mentioned, the dark markets and things like that. But Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are also used very legitimately by a lot of other people as well. So what the future holds, we'll see. Okay, that's, uh, hopefully I've laid some foundation for you and we can get to some questions on the panel later, maybe.
Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> hey, my name is Alf Chan. I'm one of the detectives of our computer cybercrime. Uh, my perspective is going to be more of the boots to the ground, what actually happens when the investigation comes to a conclusion, uh, some of the challenges that we have dealing with the uh, judicial system, and uh, some of the interesting stories that, uh, that we hear uh, every day. Uh, first, talk to you, I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, this uh, really, really, really high-end heart surgeon is having his classic car fixed. He's talking to the mechanic, can you fix my car? No problem. Mechanic fixes his car, gives the doctor his bill. He says, hey doc, you know what, you and I, we do the same thing. I open up the car, I look at the problem, diagnose it, take out the parts, put the parts back in, and it's all good. But you get paid 10 times more than I do. Why is that? And the doctor's looked at the mechanic and says, try doing it while the car is running. So this is how we kind of feel right now. We feel like we're working on an interesting problem that's always progressing and almost evolving. Uh, we're looking at an industry that uh, has new technologies, new pivots, and, and we're dealing it at a, uh, on my side, a municipal level, so we don't have exactly the greatest budget or resources. And, uh, and, we're, and I'll share some of the things that we are going to have. <clears throat> so, so I'm going to just talk about three things. It's basically three aspects that we're going to look at. It's prevention, attribution, and prosecution. Okay? So prevention, okay, it's the hard ways to learn. We all, I think most of us, touch the stove and it burnt our hand, and it's usually the quickest way to learn not to touch the stove. Unfortunately, in this world of victimization, you don't really want to be defrauded or hacked and lose a good sizable chunk of money to learn that you should not post your password on Facebook. So one of the things that we're dealing with is an outreach. Um, we're realizing that technology is more complex. It makes the people who are more aware having the advantage against the ones who are not aware. Um, for example, we used to have um, a, a ransomware, for example. Your computer's locked, you have to get Bitcoin, and here are the instructions of how to get Bitcoin. You actually had to give instructions and even a toll-free phone number and email for, for help to get Bitcoin because it was such a new technology. Uh, I've heard of stories where, um, unfortunately, they tried to buy Bitcoin, the ATM was broken, they bought $500 worth of Bitcoin, but by the time they actually transferred it, the Bitcoin value dropped, and they didn't have enough money to send to them. So all these interesting issues, oh, perfect. Let me let that slideshow. There you go, perfect. So prevention, yeah, prevention, here we go. So all these things are, are getting more difficult, but now, as technology uh, progresses, it, it, things get easier. ATMs are in hasty markets now, uh, you don't need any identification to use them. The limits right now is $1,000 per transaction at a hasty market, and there's no limit on how many uh, consecutive transactions you can do. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. <clears throat> um, there's a particular one where uh, we had a call where a gentleman uh, was contacted by the CRA, uh, and one of the scams was, okay, you have to go you have to go to the Apple store and buy $5,000 worth of iTunes cards, and then you give me the serial number of the cards. He did it. So this guy went to the Apple store, <laughs> bought $5,000 worth of the iTunes cards, and gave him all the serial numbers. Realizing that's a great victim, he says, oh, by the way, you also have to go to the Bitcoin machine at the Hasty Market and give $4,800 in Bitcoin, and he did. So these are the things that are, are, are happening. These are actual true victims. And because it's happening, it's going to continue happening because it's profitable. It really is. <clears throat> so the next thing I'm going to talk about really quickly is attribution. And I like this one because it's like it just fingers that, you know, that dog did it. Uh, attribution is kind of our business. We are actually in the business of finding out who did it. Okay. Unfortunately, one of the things with businesses, especially large businesses, small, medium businesses, Attribution isn't exactly your priority, right? Not at all. You're looking for incident recovery, disaster recovery. Uh, you're looking to just get back into the normal business of, of making money and not losing uh, customer uh, information, data, or uh, trust. So this is an issue here where we dealt with a couple of corporate uh, entities where they come to the Toronto Police because their head office is here or their servers are here, and they come with an interesting problem. We have a hack. We're a breach. We need some help. 
but we don't want to tell you about it and we don't want to formally report it. So it makes a very interesting dynamic here. Uh, everyone's heard of the Ashley Madison hack. Uh, that actually took two months for them to actually decide to come with us. And obviously within those two months, there's a lot of investigative blunders by them, private security, there's a whole story behind it. Uh, but it does affect the overall investigation and the possible success of those investigations. <clears throat> We're building a, a couple of relationships with the private sector uh, to try to kind of mitigate that kind of border of what we can and cannot do. We will help with you. Uh, we worked with uh, a large telecommunic telecommunications company. I'm not gonna say the name, um, but we worked with them with a hacking uh, occurrence that was started in March, I don't know, sorry, January of this year. Uh, eventually ended up with a uh, arrest, seizure of Bitcoins. It was a second seizure of Tia from Toronto Police. Um, Peter had the pleasure of getting the first one, so I'm glad to meet him. Um, and it was interesting. So when we're dealing with Caesar, seizures, we're not really understanding a lot of the processes because it hasn't been done before. And I'll catch on that in the prosecution section. Another thing too about, uh, how many of you are in small BM businesses? A couple of them, okay, cool. So this is the issue here is that you have a large business, you might have cyber insurance, you might have a whole team of, uh, of people dealing with uh, incident recovery. But when you are hacked or data is lost, you have to make a decision whether or not you're gonna report it. And there's a new bill coming out with the Digital Privacy Act that you, are, you must comply and report. Even that right there is, if you try to read it, you have to report it, but report to who? RCMP, OPP, Toronto Police, FinTrack? Who, who do we report to? There's a lot of things that are just clouded out, uh, and a lot of uh, even cybersecurity firms are calling us to figure out, are we supposed to call you? And to us, we're like, we're not too sure. We're ready for it, but we're not too sure where you're supposed to report to. Uh, future things, for example, uh, the challenges in owning wallets. Um, Peter mentioned that about changing the, uh, the wallets. Uh, we do have very, very limited capability of analysis. And we're looking to um, increase that, but that's just only public ledgers. There's also like private ledgers where you can't see the transactions. So there's also there's some difficulties we're looking at. And uh, cryptocurrency, obviously you can say you buy houses and things like that. This is the best slide I've seen about buying Bitcoin. So if you happen to have a half million dollars Bitcoin and you want to slide into a new Lamborghini, uh, Newport Beach, go for it, it's pretty cool. I mean, I, when I first saw Bitcoin being accepted at coffee stores, I thought that was the coolest thing ever, but this is actually, this doesn't do it justice, it's awesome. Okay, last thing I wanna talk about is the prosecution and dealing with courts. So I've had the privilege to go through one uh, particular investigation that dealt with Bitcoin. So first of all, seizing the Bitcoin. We're in a search warrant at this guy's house uh, we were lucky enough to grab him when his laptop and computers were on the screen, so it wasn't locked out. Uh, we saw there was a Bitcoin wallet there. We knew he did a lot of transactions uh, online. And of course, you have to deal with security because it's not usually open. It has passphrases and so forth. Um, fortunately for us, he left a nice screenshot of all his passwords on his screen, which is, made our life easier. But even then, how do you transfer it? You know, do you, do you transfer it to a wallet um, specifically for Toronto Police Service. Did you, and when you transfer it, who incurs the fees? How do we keep track of that? Okay, so at that time, we, had, we knew he was gonna be released the next day, so we had to take control of the wallet. And wallets are a little bit different because control really is the point of seizure. So you have a house, you have a, a, an account, the bank uh, has control over it. You have a car, you could tow it and put it in a pound. But cryptocurrency, it's, uh, a lot of it's decentralized. You, there's no one to say like, yeah, stop this person from withdrawing or changing this wallet. So you actually have to take control of it by transferring it to your own wallet. And after that, you have to secure it some way. So, uh, of course, it's like three in the morning and we're trying to figure out what happened, so I transfer it to my work phone. So my work phone all of a sudden became $200 to about $80,000 worth of value. It was kind of scary. So from there, uh, we try to contact other people to find out what is the best practice of dealing with this type of cryptocurrency. No one else has done it. So it's kind of interesting. We eventually turned it into a paper wallet offline and placed it through our normal property um, seizure procedures. So it's offline. 
So at least we know it's not gonna get hacked. However, there's obviously some other things. Uh, our technical side is probably talking about forking. You know, what happens if your currency is in the middle of that and you just don't get it afterwards? What kind of liability were it? There's a lot of questions that are interesting. Um, even forms, we uh, even just trying to seize it. Um, I mean, there's, there's difficult, there's complex, and then there's trying to change a government form. I'm not sure if you ever tried to change a form before, but in our seizure forms, there actually is nothing for virtual currency. And I've called them up to say, well, you need to change this because I, I can't even fill out the form to seize this. And they're like, well, we'll, we'll deal with it. So those are the things that we're kind of uh, dealing as challenges. So we've had the luck of uh, having a conclusion to this particular case. There was 21 Bitcoin that was seized um, and the court uh, made a decision to split it. Said, okay, 10 Bitcoin goes back to uh, the complainant and the other one is seized. So how, how do we split it? Um, unfortunately, one part of the order says it in increments of Bitcoin. It says 10 Bitcoin has to go here. But then another piece of paper, the forfeiture order says, oh, $65,000 has to go to this person. And right now, there's a gap. There's actually an excess of money. What are we going to do with this? So those are the things that we're going to deal with, with a lot of growing pains on even nomenclature, how to describe uh, certain Bitcoin, and, and even just how to have uh, judges and crowns to understand what uh, cryptocurrency really does. And just to give you a last um, example of some of the technical, I guess, aptitude, is that one time we, we had a, a picture of Google Earth with a particular address to kind of showcase this is what the house kind of looks like from our information. Uh, and a judge only had one question. He said, well, when did you do the search? 11 o'clock at night. Then why is the picture daylight? He didn't understand that Google Earth is just a picture. It's not a real time. So we're dealing with that with our judicial system. We're dealing with that with, uh, across the board. So with all these challenges, I'm going to keep it really short, that it's an evolving problem. And I think the only way is really to have a strong private um, and public relationship to deal with these kind of uh, relationships. And this kind of relationship, I think we can actually work on the engine while it's running. Thank you.